Hey guys, today we're starting a new unit. It's about things that rotate. Now I'll get to more, well, actually, you know what? I'm gonna show you the study guide right now, because why not? Um, all right, so this is it. This is posted in the uh, in the classroom. Um, it's not in one of the, the dated sections. It's up there near the top, so you can see this anytime you want. If you wanna print a copy of it, go for it. Uh, if not, then uh, then just use it just like this. Uh, it might actually be useful for you to print out a copy though, because it does have lots of equations on it. Now, as always, the equations that are in bold, those are on the AP gouge. And the ones that are not in bold, those are ones that appear in the textbooks, but are not on the AP gouge. Um, and there's a lot of them. So it might be useful for you to have a copy when you're trying to figure out what to do. Um, the sections here, chapter six and chapter seven, um, circular, chapter six is circular motion, orbits and gravity. That's the name of the chapter. Uh, and then uh, chapter seven is rotational motion. We're going to do most of chapter six. Uh, the, um, they're, the sections are listed here on the objectives. Um, and then we're also going to do quite a bit of chapter seven uh, as well, but not all of it. And then we're actually also going to take a couple little pieces out of chapter eight, but those are pretty minor. We'll be able to go over those in part of one day. So I don't even list those on the, on the top, on the top here. Um, Second page here, we have the homework assignments. These homework assignments are approximate. Um, all the dates are obviously TBA. Uh, I may shuffle these around a little bit or change them slightly, but this is generally what we're going to be doing. And today's assignment is this one up here. You already know that it's on the, uh, it's on the um, assignment here for today. Uh, today, specifically, what we're going to cover is we're going to briefly review centripetal acceleration. We've seen that before. And then we're going to move on from that to centripetal force. I'll give you an example or two of problems that use that because your, your homework tonight is basically calculating centripetal force and using the equation for centripetal force. And then finally, we'll figure, uh, finish up with a short discussion of centrifugal force, which is something that you've probably heard of before. So let's start off here. Um, Centripetal acceleration, you may recognize this. It's A sub C equals V squared over R, meaning centripetal acceleration. We can figure out what it is by squaring the speed and dividing it by the radius of the circle. So if we're a guy, a person on a spinny ride here from the carnival, um, uh, if the thing is rotating at constant speed, um, the velocity of any particular rider is changing, even though their speed is not changing. And the reason their velocity is changing, as you recall, is that their direction is changing. And since velocity is speed in a direction and acceleration is a change in velocity, that means that if their direction is changing, their velocity is changing and they are accelerating. And we learned before that if we're talking about motion in a circle here, like on the spinning ride, the acceleration is always directly toward the center of rotation if we have a situation where the speed does not change, we're just going around in a circle at constant rate, okay? And this formula gives us the uh, value for the acceleration. It comes out in meters per second squared, and that uh, acceleration is always directly toward the center of the circle, okay? Now, today, we're going to combine that with Newton's laws because that's what we learned last time. And particularly, we're interested in Newton's second law, which as you know, is F equals MA. So second law says that um, if an object accelerates, uh, it is because there's an unbalanced force acting on it. Okay, so we're going to use second law in this form, and we're going to substitute in centripetal acceleration for the acceleration term here, and that comes up looking like this. So centripetal force, that's F sub C, centripetal force, is mv squared over r. So F is the F and F equals MA. Uh, M is the same mass, uh, but since it's a, it's a centripetal acceleration, meaning directed toward the center, that means that it's a centripetal force, which means that there's a force pulling the thing toward the center. And that uh, shows up as uh, V squared over R. Okay, so if I'm spinning a, uh, a ball around on the end of a string, as you know, string is tension. Uh, strings only pull, and since the uh, uh, the string is going around and around in a circle, and it's always pointing at the ball, uh, that force, that centripetal force, has to be pointing toward the center. This formula will give it to us. Now, let me show you some units on this, 
because it's easier to write it on the clipboard than to uh, um, type it out here. Okay, so we have F sub C, this is going to be in Newtons and it is always directed toward the center of rotation. M is still mass in kilograms because mass is always in kilograms. R is the radius of the rotation and that is going to be in meters. And V is the speed, the tangential speed, tangential speed. So that's the speed that the outside of the circle is moving. Um, if we have a rotating object, like as we're using the spinny ride before, and it's rotating in this direction, the tangential speed would be the speed that our object that we're interested in is moving in that direction. So once at the top, it's moving to the right. When it's over here, it's moving straight down. When it's over here, it's moving up that direction. But it's always got some speed in meters per second, the tangential speed. Okay. That is in meters per second, and we square that, so that's going to be squared. Okay, now if we analyze the units on this, we wind up with kilograms times meters squared per second squared, and then we're dividing that by meters times one over meters. That's the, the radius part of this. Now, one of these meters cancels out, and that leaves us with kilogram meters per second squared, kilogram meters per second squared, which you probably recognize is newtons. So they, the units do work out on this. Um, as always, it's useful sometimes to carry the units through your calculations so you can be sure you've arrived at the right place and you're dividing where you're supposed to be dividing and multiplying where you're supposed to be multiplying. Okay, um, let's see. So that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, centripetal force. Force always acting toward the center of rotation. Now let's run through one, uh, one example problem here. Uh, we're going to use the same spinny ride. And we're going to say that the radius of the ride is five meters, okay? Um, we're gonna say it's spinning at 14 RPM, meaning it goes around 14 times every minute. And we're gonna look at a rider over here who has a mass of 50 kilograms and we want to figure out the uh, centripetal force on the rider. So let's go back to the clipboard. So 50 kilogram rider, this ride's going around 14 RPM and the radius of the ride is five meters and it's going around something like this. Okay, so the equation that we're gonna use is going to be the centripetal force uh, equation, which is F sub C equals M V squared over R. Uh, and some of these numbers were given and some of them were not. So we know uh, the mass, we've got that one. We know the radius of the ride itself, but we don't know the tangential speed. So we're gonna do a little sidetrack here to figure out what the tangential speed is of the rider as he's, as he's going around. Okay, so uh, speed, as you know, is distance divided by time. So what we need to figure out is how far they go in some convenient period of time. And all we know is that it's 14 RPM, goes around 14 times in one minute, and that the radius is five meters. So the way we're gonna do this is, um, uh, we're gonna figure out the distance, which is going to be once around. So once around a circle is two times pi times the radius, which is five meters. Okay, because pi times the diameter is the circumference of a circle. And then we know it's going around 14 times in one minute. So we're gonna multiply that by 14. And th that happens in one minute. And we usually use seconds in physics. So we're gonna say 60 seconds, okay? All right, now when we multiply all this out, Let's find a glare-free spot. This looks like a glare-free spot. Two times pi times five times 14 equals divided by 60 equals. And we get 7.3 meters per second. Okay, that's our tangential speed is equal to V. So now we have what we need because we now we can start plugging stuff into mv squared over r. So f sub c is equal to the mass, which is 50 kilograms, times v, which is 7.3 meters per second. And we're going to square that whole thing. 
and we're going to divide it by the radius, which is 5 meters. All right, and when we do that, we get 50 times 7.3x squared equals divided by 5 equals, and we get 530 newtons. That's the force, all right? Now, that is the force that is pulling the rider, if we have a rider out here, that is pulling the rider toward the center of the ride. Um, if you are a person riding this ride, then uh, if you are the rider, then you're going to feel like you're lying on a, uh, a stretcher or something with 530 newtons of force basically pushing you against the wall. Um, and just roughly speaking, uh, if you were lying flat on the floor, your weight would be approximately 500 newtons. It'd be a little bit less than that because it's 9.8, but if we consider it 10. So this is going to feel to you pretty much like you're lying on the ground, only you're lying against the floor. Now, most of the homework that you do, you're not going to have to do this thing here, okay? They're going to give you the speed for the most part, um, or they may give you the force and uh, have you find the speed. Um, or maybe they'll give you both and have you find the, uh, maybe find the radius, uh, but they'll generally stick to just the variables that appear in this, in this formula here. Now, I did do this dance and show you this process because that's something we're going to need to be able to do for later problems in a couple homework assignments from now. Uh, when that time comes, I'm going to show you an easier way to do that, but again, that's for another time. Okay, let's finish up here by looking at centrifugal force. That's this one here. What about centrifugal force? You've all heard of it. Well, physicists uh, are irritated and annoyed by the, uh, the concept of centrifugal force, and it makes our teeth itch when people talk about it. Even though there's a device called a centrifuge, which uses centrifugal force to separate like blood plasma into its different parts. Okay? Um, the reason that physicists are uncomfortable with the idea of centrifugal force uh, is that it only exists as a reaction force when centripetal force exists. Okay? If the wall wasn't there and the thing was spinning, you'd go flying off in a straight line. That's what the first uh, Newton's first law says. An object in motion will remain in motion in a straight line until acted on by an outside force. And the fact that you're not moving in a straight line, the fact that you're forced to follow this circular path means that the wall is pushing on you. It's pushing on you toward the center. It is applying a centripetal force toward the center of the ride. Now, you feel that push. And third law says that for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. Forces come in pairs. If the wall is pushing on you, you are pushing on the wall. And that you pushing on the wall, we perceive that as centrifugal force. But it only exists as a reaction force. It, you only experience it when the wall is pushing on you. Okay, so for this reason, we call centrifugal force a fictitious force. It never exists by itself. It's never an action force. What do I mean by that? When you get on, this, on the ride, if you do push yourself against the wall, the wall doesn't start spinning. The ride does not start spinning. Uh, the fact that you're pushing on the wall and, and simulating a centrifugal force doesn't cause a centripetal force to appear in response to your push. Likewise, if I have a ball on a string and I spin the string, there's tension in the string. That's a centripetal force. Uh, but the ball experiences that as a centrifugal force. It feels like something is pushing them away from the center. Um, but if I just hang the string there and I pull on the ball, um, it doesn't start spinning. The centripetal force does not appear as a reaction or a response to a, centri a centrifugal force. Okay, a little long-winded, but that's what it is. Bottom line here, centrifugal force only exists as a reaction force. It never exists on its own. And for that reason, we call it a fictitious force. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we reviewed cent centripetal acceleration. We uh, introduced centripetal force, did an example of it, and then we uh, debunked centrifugal force. That's what we got. All right, thanks for your time, and we will see you next time.